Hey everyone, it's Lindsay, and thanks for tuning in to First Aid Express. Today, we are diving into the realm of epidemiology with the historic Bradford Hill criteria that are the most cited and applied frameworks to suggest causal inferences. Now, what does this mean? We all know the historic correlation does not imply causation that is preached in pretty much all statistics classes. But what if certain associations do imply causation? Why do we care? Well, why do we champion any public health campaign? Does smoking really cause lung cancer? And what about UV light and radiation on skin cancer? The entire reason the Bradford Hill criteria were made was to determine cause and effect relationships to effectively practice preventative occupational medicine. This is why we care. And this is why we still use these nine criteria to guide investigations and help prevent disease in the future. And thanks to modern medicine bringing in greater understanding of genetics and molecular biology in response to carcinogens, toxins, and the like, we're even more capable of exploring these cause and effect relationships and understanding the complexity of disease due to exposure. Without further ado, let's dive in. Today, our singular aim covers the entire set of nine Bradfield Hill criteria. Rather than strictly memorizing this list, also found in your first aid public health chapter, I will help you describe each criterion and apply them to a clinical scenario to really make these statistical measures stick. The first criterion we have today is strength. While association does not equal causation, the larger the association, the more likely the relationship is to be causal. Now, how do we apply this? Let's use the same example that Hill did. In the UK, Percival Pott examined the incidence of scrotal cancer in chimney sweeps the very same ones that dance around the screen in Mary Poppins. He found a very strong strength of association between workplace exposure and disease. In chimney sweeps, the incidence of scrotal cancer was 200 times greater than in other jobs. Increased exposure to chimney soot was found to be the causal factor. Next, let's talk about consistency. This one's pretty easy. Results should be replicable, meaning studies in multiple locations, populations, and using different methods should come to the same causal conclusion between exposure and effect. Repetitive findings, when mass-produced, introduces statistically sound findings that strengthens validity. But see our other stats videos on that. Now clinically, what does this mean? Well, if you're a Star Wars fan like me, this means in the Clone Wars, no matter where the battle armor is made, no matter when, even if they're constructed differently, we see similar results. While they may not be the exact clones of each other, they're at least coming to the same conclusion. Medically, this means disease, let's say melanoma, is observed to be associated with UV exposure in observational, molecular, and in vitro studies across many different decades and countries. Moving on, let's talk about specificity. This criterion suggests the more specific the relationship, the more likely the exposure causes disease. In today's era, we usually attempt to pin down the dose of exposure to the chemical or biologic agent. Clinically, specificity can be applied to asbestos exposure to lung disease, such as asbestosis, mesothelioma, and other fibrotic pathologic processes. In modern medicine, we attempt to demonstrate a specific molecular mechanism between the agent and disease pathology. For more on asbestos and lung disease, be sure to check out our videos in the respiratory chapter featuring yours truly. Our next criterion is temporality, and this one is pretty non-negotiable, and the only criterion that must be met. Temporality simply states that the cause or exposure must precede its effect or onset of disease. Unfortunately, we all know about the effect of thalidomide on children of women who took the medicine when they were pregnant. In the early 1950s and 60s, women used thalidomide as a particularly powerful anti-emetic for morning sickness. However, we did not know how catastrophic it was for the babies. Thousands of who died in utero or were born with severe limb defects. This can also be applied to mothers who use DES in utero, whose daughters have increased risk of breast cancer and vaginal clear cell adenocarcinoma. Our next criterion is biological gradient, meaning if a dose response is seen, it's more likely that the cause-effect relationship is causal. More exposure, more effect. If you're thinking, Lindsay, this is incredibly simplistic and things are a lot more complex than that. Well, you'd be right. 
Even Hill recognized that a linear dose response rarely ever exists due to individual susceptibilities and environment. Let's apply that to liver toxicity and acute liver failure. Taking anywhere from 325 mg to 4,000 mg of acetaminophen, also known as paracetamol outside of the U.S., is generally safe for your body. However, if you ingest a toxic amount, usually over 4 grams a day, a toxic metabolite called NAPQI can accumulate through a known reaction by SIP-mediated hydroxylation, logical and known dose-response chemical reactions that lead to liver toxicity, which is also an example of our next criterion, plausibility. The plausibility criterion requires a logical mechanism where cause and exposure can rationally lead to effect and disease. Historically, we can use the story of the radium girls as our clinical example for plausibility, which can be backed up by specific molecular mechanisms showing effects ranging at even low doses of exposures. In the case of radium, it decays, releasing radioactive alpha particles that induce double-stranded DNA breaks, targeting osteoblasts and bone marrow. These are also common mechanisms taken advantage for modern targeted chemoradiation cancers. But back to our girls. From 1917 to 1926, women were employed as painters for the Radium Corporation to paint luminescent radium-lit watch faces. Using brushes for that fine work required pinpoint bristles, which the women used their lips to spin. The motto was lip, dip, and paint, which inadvertently dosed them with radiation, leading to anemia, fractures, and jaw necrosis. To add insult to injury, the company marketed the paint as safe, so the girls also painted their nails, teeth, and skin with radium. Woof, not such a bright idea, hey? Now we have coherence, which in reality is pretty similar to plausibility. Basically, the cause and effect relationship should make sense. It shouldn't contradict known scientific knowledge or processes. Hill used the historic case of observed bronchial epithelium changes with the carcinogenicity of cigarette smoke to relate cigarette smoking to cancer pathology. Today, this is reinforced and bolstered by molecular evidence. And similarly, experiment is another pretty common sense criterion. Evidence derived from experimental manipulation may lead to the strongest empiric support for cause and effect relationships. Going along the same line, thanks to multifaceted experiments with different approaches and our modern medical advancements, we know the exact mechanism by which carcinogens induce carcinogenesis on the molecular level. Not only supporting the experiment criteria, but also coherence and plausibility among others too. And last but not least, we have the analogy criterion. This criterion uses the basic understanding that if there is a strong established relationship for one cause and effect process, a similar cause can be expected to have a similar effect and can be inferred, even if there's weaker evidence for the relationship. Let's consider carbon nanotubes. These respirable fibers are similar in morphology to asbestos and would be expected to have the same deposition, inflammation, and fibrotic response as asbestos if inhaled. Multiple studies have even shown the similarities in response. Therefore, despite carbon nanotubes not having as robust of investigations or concrete associations as asbestos, previous studies to the latter demonstrate a strong assumption for causal relationships between carbon nanotubes exposure and lung inflammation and disease. And that sums up our discussion on the Bradford Hill criteria. Before we go, let's check in with a quick flash quiz. What is the one inarguable criterion that must be present in order for a causal relationship to be considered? Temporality. While the other eight criteria aren't musts or set in stone, temporality is an absolute must. Remember, exposure always must precede the onset of disease, no matter how short or how long between the two. Before you go, let's cover a few quick takeaways from today's video. Remember that the Bradford Hill criteria is used in epidemiology to support a cause and effect relationship. Historically and even today, they are used to guide occupational and public health measures to prevent disease. Of all of the criteria, temporality is the only criterion that absolutely must be present for the relationship to be considered. Cause before effect. The rest can be considered after. To refresh on the list of nine criteria quickly, be sure to check out the table in First Aid's public health chapter. 
More than anything in statistics, I find it much easier to remember if you have a clinical scenario to put them into context. So if you ever find yourself feeling a little fuzzy about the details of plausibility, biological gradient, or analogy, come back for another quick review with me. Again, my name is Lindsay, and it's been a joy walking you through First Aid's public health chapter. If you thought this video was helpful, throw a thumbs up down below. I'll see you back here for more First Aid Express videos. Good luck and happy studying!